Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a great story of a medical leave loophole. But first a story from Chef Dad 64 Hey, I got a nice surprise for you when you come into work tomorrow. Merry Christmas! So I work in a hospital that has a union. For those who don't know, union jobs are great in terms of pay and benefits. But accountability is the shortcoming of being part of a union. I basically tell people a union is infinite get out of jail free cards for people who don't deserve the job they have. After two years of working at this job, I got a position where I kept the cafeteria clean and stocked on weekdays and worked dishwashing in patient tray line on weekends. Though my department is awesome now compared to when I first started there, for the longest time we had the most toxic and dramatic department. The collective catchphrase in response to everything for the department was, that's not my job. This is popular because the union would back up anyone who uses that phrase and requires each position have a dedicated task list to make it fair. I do my best to be a hard worker, a team player, be fair, and go on above and beyond my duties. However, what I feel I'm being taken advantage of, the catchphrase will kick in full swing for me. This one time on Christmas Eve, I was working the dish room for the afternoon. I noticed a giant pan with a bunch of burnt on scrambled egg on the sides and bottom, which hadn't been soaked. I didn't think anything of it as the AM dishwasher is usually finishing up the breakfast stuff by the time I get there and figure they'll get to it or have a plan for how to get it off easy. I do notice that my sink is full of oatmeal and noodles which does really annoy me since it's really not hard for them to just scrape the food into the trash before soaking instead of risking clogging the drains which has happened before. AM dish person washes all the cookware and service equipment, while PM does the patient trays, plates, cups, and bowls. Business as usual, so I think, and AM shift ends at 2.30 PM. My coworker decided to disappear before 2 until it was time to clock out, leaving me by myself. I continue on and try to let it go and see that the same pan of burnt egg just sitting in there. I get really pissed off and decide they're pushing it way too much with me today. Before I continue on with washing the dishes, I check the work schedule and see that the same coworker who took advantage of me is scheduled to come in for the same shift the next day on Christmas. And I decide it's time for a little malicious compliance. Since the breakfast dishes are the AM dish person's responsibility, it's pretty much not my job to wash that egg crusted pan. And I put the pan to the side and tell my coworkers not to touch it. When we close for the night, I put the pan back into the sink and just leave it without soaking it in water as an extra little gift. I was off the next day on Christmas. They found my present and were not pleased to put it in nicely from what I heard. If you've ever tried to get burnt scrambled egg off the sides of a pan, especially if it sat for a full 24 hours without soaking, then you'll know that you would have an easier time separating two Legos super glued together. After that, it was never an issue again and management had my back. I love this story and I agree with everything OP did here, except for OP's description of a union. They said it's like infinite get out of jail free cards for people who don't deserve the job they have. Aren't unions all about fighting for what you do deserve? Shouldn't just about every place have some kind of union if possible? Or is it actually just a enriching get out of jail free card for jobs people don't deserve? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Dumpsterfire15. Don't like it? Leave. This happened today. My husband and I have been car shopping as I was in an auto accident at the beginning of summer. Our car was totaled in the accident and it's been a long process. We finally decided on the automobile we wanted, got all our paperwork completed, and had our financing all worked out. All we needed to do was sign all of the paperwork and drive away. The dealership is 90 minutes from our house, so we took the kids out of school early and my husband took off work after lunch. We wanted to make sure we were home in time to keep our typical school night schedule going. We get to the dealership at our agreed upon time. We did one more test drive and were ready to sign everything. Then the game started. All of a sudden the finance office wasn't ready for us. Then after almost a two hour wait, they were ready. The finance person started by trying to upsell us on all the add-ons dealers try to sell you. We told her we didn't want anything extra, we just wanted to look at the numbers, read the paperwork, sign it all, and head out. 
Due to our weight, we had a limited amount of time to get this done and still be able to get home in time for the kid's bedtime routine. The first thing she does is pull out a different set of numbers than we were originally given and agreed to. All of a sudden, there's a dealership fee for selling us a car at this time of year. Nearly a thousand dollars for this nonsense. Then she states that if we don't like the fee, we could leave as they have people begging to buy cars from them. So my husband and I stood to leave. She then tells us we can't leave as we already printed the forms. I laughed at her and told her to go out and get one of those beggars to buy it. So far, the finance person has called twice, and the salesperson's called four times. I guess they weren't expecting someone to get that far and then walk away. Honestly, I hate this crap and I can relate to it. I'm gonna name drop and I don't even care. A couple years back, I got a vehicle from CarMax. They got a listed price, everything's fine. The very last step of the buying process, they drop a $1,500 fee on top of that. Well, I'm a moron and I wanted the vehicle, so I went ahead and paid it, but holy crap, did that make me grin and bear it. Definitely took any of the pleasantry I did have out of the rest of the experience. I don't think I sugarcoated or put on a fake smile for anyone beyond that at that point. Needless to say, be like OP and don't be like a moron like me and fall for this. They try to hook you with a fee right at the very end. That ain't right. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Shake Your Booty, The Leave Loophole. Back in the mid-90s, I worked for a bank that was in the process of being taken over. The bank used to have both sick time and vacation accruals, but the new owners laughed at that and told everyone they'd be migrated to a new time bank system that would give 75% of vacation time and 25% of sick time. Also, only 40 hours of your PTO was going to carry over to the next year, period. This pissed off a lot of the long-term workers who had been with the company since the 1970s. Loads of workers lost literal months of accrued time off because of corporate penny-pinching. Up until the takeover, sick time would carry over indefinitely. So if you had a surgery or needed some other form of long-term care, you could take the time off you needed. My coworker Mary had been with the company since the new corporate building was opened in 1971. Mary was well past retirement age, but kept working because she liked her job and it got her out of the house. She wasn't hurting for money either. Her husband had retired from his union job all the way back in the 80s, and his pension had kept them both well taken care of. But Mary also didn't like being jerked around by inane corporate BS. When the change in time off was announced, Mary noticed two things about the announcement. First, the policy would go in effect the next quarter, so there were still two months left before the changeover. Second, they would honor sick time for any medical leave that was approved prior to the changeover date, provided the worker had enough sick time and vacation available. The next Monday, Mary filed for medical leave with HR. Her husband had fallen and broken his ankle, and the doctor required that he be in a cast for eight weeks, with an additional four weeks of physical therapy. As Mary was the sole caretaker for her husband, she qualified for medical leave to provide aid for him. Coincidentally, Mary had just enough sick time and vacation time to cover the leave. Funny thing is, more than a few of the ladies Mary worked with knew both Mary and her husband, who was billed like a workhorse and just as stubborn. The idea that Mary needed to care for her husband was preposterous, let alone the idea that her husband would want Mary to take care of him. Three months pass by, and Mary returns to the office to pack her belongings. It turns out that after confirming her medical leave was going to be paid out, she timed her retirement to coincide with the end of the leave. Honestly, if there's any kind of corporate takeover and they're taking away all of this accrued time, I am fully on board with you taking multiple months off if you have that much time accrued. God willing, you've given decades of your life to this company. You deserve those couple months. Our next story is from Dern Foreigner. Put a label on it. Okay. As a poor student many years ago, I lived in a house with five other poor students. We had a shared kitchen with a shared refrigerator. I had a big jug of water I would keep chilled in the fridge. I'd occasionally throw a few limes or lemons into it if I could afford it. It was the only cold drink I could afford at the time. I was really poor. I didn't mind other folks using it as long as they topped it up from time to time, but 
I'd come home from class and find an empty jug sitting in the refrigerator. I'd fill it, put it back, come back later, and it would be empty again. I started getting annoyed. The final straw came when I walked into the kitchen and my roommate was drinking straight from the jug. Really, dude? I yelled at the guy. Hey, show some respect and use a glass. Better yet, get your own jug. That's not yours. Roommate shrugged his shoulders and said, well, you should have put a label on it. I went to bed seething. In the middle of the night, it came to me. Yes, label it is. Cue malicious compliance. Next morning, I found a label and in bold Sharpie wrote five letters. U-R-I-N-E. I stuck it on the jug and put it back in the fridge. Later on, I returned home to find a housemate staring into the refrigerator. Why is there a jug of urine in the fridge? Oh no, that's not urine. It's a jug of water with urine written on the side. Then why is it labeled urine? To discourage everyone from drinking it. But you're more than welcome to have some, I said. He stared at me confused, then back at the refrigerator. Nah, I'm good. This question was eventually asked by everyone in the house. I answered it the same honest way. It was perfectly clear that it was a jug of water with some sliced lemons in it. No one drank my water again. Ever. Turns out no one will drink water from a jug that's labeled urine. One of life's little mysteries. Maybe in a weird way, OP writing that urine label and sticking it on their jug makes it register in other people's heads that that jug really belongs to somebody else and maybe it's gross to be sharing this jug with another person. Maybe they're afraid urine was in it at one point. Or maybe they're afraid if they misuse it, maybe one day it will be urine. And our final story of the day is from Maintenance Man 163 Justify Your Actions. This is a short and sweet story that started many moons ago, back when work was a simpler time. We had a member of the maintenance team, let's call him Bill, return from another assignment. Now, Bill was a rather blunt man. One who would also look down on us lowly production workers. Well, each day, we had to enter any piece of equipment that doesn't function properly. Now, on our production equipment, there's a part that needs to be swapped out and cleaned, usually twice or three times a shift. We ran three shifts. More so for newer users. Maybe once a week if you're experienced enough at the workflow process. We have over a hundred machines that run. Bill decided that we're no longer explaining the reasoning behind cleaning as it wasn't descriptive enough and we had to justify our actions of replacing the part for cleaning. Being the lead of production for an entire shift, I offered to support my team and fill out their new cleaning log to justify the cleaning procedure. Each log would now start with something similar to the date, time, employee, A quick description of how the machine was running. Maybe at this point, I might add the actual issue that was detected to require the cleaning. Then, I would continue to explain how we switched the part out, who switched the part out, maybe add in a witness statement about the problem. This way, Bill would have to comb through every line of these cleaning logs to find the justification so he could record it as he had volunteered himself to track this new data. After the first day of now getting a one to two page paper explaining every little reason to clean this part, I got an email asking me to simply write part replaced for cleaning from Bill's supervisor. Personally, I wouldn't want to go against Bill's wishes, so I politely declined to go back to the old method of documentation and continued with this new system for over a month before the plant manager had to tell me it was no longer a functional log. What I don't understand here is if this has been the way of life for these workers, it's not like just part of the work, but like an expected part of the work that's happened a certain way over the course of a long time. Why all of a sudden do you need to take a reductive step back and start documenting basically what should be, I guess, considered routine maintenance? All I know is, is if I was working in a place like this, there is nothing more annoying than doing something that is basically common sense and having to stop and make sure that you jot down on a piece of paper why and what you're doing. I feel like this is almost as bad as like a bus driver having to stop and write down why they're filling the gas tank just before they pull the bus back into the lot to park for the night. 
But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely crazy compliance story, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.